So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, according to the uh, auditorium clock, it's now 3 p.m. And I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to today's Ørsted lecture. My name is uh, Rasmus Larsen. I'm the uh, university provost, and I have the honor of uh, bidding welcome to uh, everybody here today. So, as you all know, the Ørsted uh, lecture series is a lecture series where we uh, invite the most influential scientists of the world to come to DTU and tell uh, DTU staff and students about uh, their research and hopefully uh, to uh, in inspire them. We are lucky today to have uh, Professor Albert Laszlo Barabasi with us. Professor Barabasi is with uh, Northeastern University, Harvard University, and also the Central uh, Euro European uh, University. So the topic of today, as you can see, is network science, a topic that emerges in many of the fields that we are interested at at, uh, at DTU. Uh, and I would also like to mention that uh, it became cer certainly apparent to all of us during the pandemic uh, that network science was important, and uh, colleagues here at DTU also made considerable effort there and provided advice to our government uh, on how the, um, the reaction of the population were to the restrictions that were uh, imposed. And I'm also mentioning the pandemic because I know Professor Barabasi himself did important work uh, during uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. But in order to make a proper uh, introduction to uh, Professor Barabasi and the scientific field, I'd like to invite our colleague, Professor Sune Lehmann from uh, DTU Compute, himself a network scientist, uh, to come up here uh, and introduce Professor Barabasi. All right, thank you so much, Rasmus. It is my great honor, great pleasure to introduce Laszlo. As you can see on the slides, he is a professor at many prestigious institutions. He is also the author of best-selling books. He is the initiator of startups. I could start to list the prizes, uh, and there's a lot of them. Uh, so he has kind of the whole package. But maybe what I want to say something about, because I've looked a lot at his work, is the incredible quality and richness of his ideas, of the sheer creativity. And I really me mean it. I, I kind of thought about this before I was going to speak, and, and I wrote down network science, mobility research, science of success, network man medicine, the science of control in networks, and many more. And probably I forgot some, so sorry, Leslie. And, and I know this is kind of like a crude thing to do, but I went on Google Scholar and I saw that he has 2,000 or 283,419 citations as we speak right now. And I just want to take a moment to think about that, right? Like you've all written papers, or many of you have, and think about the effort that goes into writing one paper. And think about the ideas that inspire almost 300,000 papers. It's unbelievable. Right, or at least uh, the citations. Um, and I think that that is such a wild impact and such an imprint on the world. And the thing that ties all of this together is really the network science. The thing that ties all these different kind of themes ranging from medicine to human mobility really is the network science. And that's what we're lucky that he's here to talk about today. So, without any further ado, Laszlo, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Sune. Can you hear me? Is this working? Okay, so the, the microphone is working. I think now that the formal part is over, I can take my jacket off, <laughs> right? And, and let's get to the uh, subject. And it's a pleasure to be here and I particularly, you know, the, uh, thanks to the pandemic and many other things, 
it's wonderful to have so many people actually in the room and we're back to kind of intellectual discourses. And I think that's one of the biggest values and, and I'm very honored to be giving the, uh, the Erstedt lecture. I obviously, like everybody else, checked out who else spoke before me. And, and, and you know, it's, it's a very distinguished group of people. So I'm, I'm hoping that I will help you continue that line. <coughs> so, and let's talk about networks in general. So my goal, is to give you a, a mosaic of why networks are important, right? And how do we think about them? And the best way to kind of fix our ideas is to, to speak about some specific networks that really determine our life and shape our life. And one of them is obviously the infrastructural networks. But pretty much all our communication uh, uh, is based on this network, what you see here, which is an early map of the internet telling us how the different routers are connected to that. That map is almost 20 years old now, but this still kind of captures the fundamental idea that the reason we are in the 21st century able to communicate and get bits of information from really far away parts of the world in an instant is because we have a a globe-spanning communication system, infrastructure, a system that allow us with the speed of light to exchange information. And this system can only work as a network, right? So if you want to kind of think about infrastructure system, there's no way you can avoid network thinking and network ideas. But we don't have to think of the globe. We can also think a little smaller, like what's happening within our brain, right? And, and fundamentally, the very idea that we have consciousness, that we can think, we can reason, that we exist, and so uh, uh, intellectually, is driven by this massive network that is within our brain. And of course, everybody knows that the brain is a network, right? Actually, the very, very first Nobel Prize in medicine was given to Rahom Kael, who actually showed us the first neurons ever, right? And Yet, what is changing now in the last kind of five to ten years is that for the first time we have maps of those networks, right? Before we only had maps of the neurons, like, like we had just pictures of the neurons. But what's changing really fundamentally now is that we started to have for some organisms full neural level maps that I think will be really transformative to the way we think about brain science and consciousness. But for our purposes, the whole complexity of thinking and consciousness is driven by an underlying network. And let's go even smaller scale, right? Within each of our cell, and every cell, there's a very, very complex network of how proteins interact with each other, as well as a complex network of chemicals that are processing the food that you normally consume and turns into no, uh, energy components. And what you see here is a network that we stare a lot in my lab because about half of my lab is focused on network medicine. This is the protein interaction network within the human cell. And these are the interactions between the proteins through which the proteins by Binding to each other, uh, each other, they assemble little machineries that are really responsible for many of the processes the cell carries uh, uh, with us. So what I wanted to kind of give you with these three examples, and I could probably continue for half an hour just giving more and more examples from economic networks, trade networks, social networks, the obvious, social media, and so on. But I wanted to kind of give, fix this idea that there are these totally different networks at different scales that have apparently nothing to do with each other, right? And the question, the challenge for network science is that how do you develop a framework of thinking? How do you develop a theory that allows you to think simultaneously about the network within your cells where tiny molecules are binding to each other or the neural network within your brain or uh, communications networks, all actually the galaxy networks in the universe. So where do we start the process? And that process obviously started way before I was even born, and it started with two Hungarian mathematicians' work and many others, but they had a particular imprint, Paul Erdős and Alfred Rainey. You may have heard of Paul Erdős, he was this very charismatic mathematician who really didn't have a home. He would travel from uh, from university to university and uh, to colleagues to colleague, and he would say, my brain is open, let's solve some math problems. 
And he would stay about five days, which is how long they can actually suffer him around, because he would wake up at five o'clock and start making noises, let's prove some. And, but Paul Erdős and Ophirinia, I mean, the many other things they have done, they were also one of the first to start thinking deeply mathematically how a network looks like. And their argument was very simple and very reasonable. They said, well, you know, we see all of these complicated networks around us. And in their first paper, they brought the example of the biological networks, neural networks, as well as transportation networks. And they said, you know, they're very complicated and they almost look random. So why don't we just assume that they are random, right? So, and, and they said, how would a randomly wired network would look like? And they said, well, the way you would look like is that you start with a bunch of nodes and you take every pair of nodes and you connect them with a certain predefined probability P. That is, let the dice decide whether somebody is connected or not. And if you use the dice, say, with probability one, of, one over six, you decide, every, uh, you pair every uh, node, you will end up with a little object like that. And this is what we call a random network. And what they did in the subsequent years is that in, in through about eight papers, they ended up explaining many of the properties of how a large random network would behave and how would you describe it mathematically. And among the many, many results they have explored, one of them is very important for us today, which is what we call the degree distribution. The degree is the mathematician's way of saying how many links you have, how many links a node has, right? And, and so you see in some of the nodes have degree one because they connect to one other one. Some have as many as four. And hence, if you want to characterize a large network, you don't look at individual nodes, you look at the distribution of them. And you can easily show for this random network that the degree distribution is a very peaked one, follows what we call a Poisson distribution, meaning that the vast majority of the nodes have roughly the same number of links around the peak of the, no uh, of the distribution, and it's very hard to find kind of deviations from the average because it decays exponentially as you get away from that, right? So that was kind of the image they had, and that model laid unchallenged till pretty much the end of 1990s and was rediscovered independently in many areas. So sociologists used a version of the random model, network model, to think about small world behavior and social networks. Ecologists have used random networks effectively to describe food webs and so on and so forth. We call this network erdos Areni model because they really put their imprint onto that. And so I said, till the end of 1990s. And the question is, what happened at the end of 1990s? Well, the model stood, but it was really never challenged by data. And the end of 1990s, thanks to the internet, we started to have access to large network maps. And we could start asking the questions, how do real networks look like? And that's where my research actually begins here as well. In 1998, actually, we started to kind of we are been looking for a network to map out, and we ended up choosing the World Wide Web. Why the World Wide Web? Because the nodes, we know that there are documents, right? And they are connected to each other by URLs. And you could write a code or a search engine, actually, or a robot, but it goes by different names, that would start from a page and it would just collect all the links and go to the next page and so on. This is the tools at actually roughly the same time that Google was developing this search engine. We're kind of running the same code within uh, our lab, right? And, and through that process, we ended up creating a map, a local map of the World Wide Web. And you can kind of see it over here. I thought that, that okay, there's the video of it, right? That was one of the maps we ended up mapping out, again, of how the networks are connected to, how the nodes are connected to each other. What was our expectation? Well, we thought the World Wide Web should be random, right? Because you are so different from each other. And everybody puts links on their web page that pertain to their personal interests. Some people care about sociology, others about sumo wrestling, yet others about physics. And the links you put on your personal web page really follow your interest. So therefore, and your interest is so different, looks random to an outside observer, so we should expect a random network with a Poisson degree distribution. 
To our great surprise, we ended up finding a very different function, what we call a power law distribution. And what you see here is a log log to scale version of the probability that a randomly chosen website would have exactly k links. And we have to put it in a log log scale for reasons that are going to be obvious in a second. In a log log scale, the fact that the empirical data lines up as a straight line tells us that the function that describes the behavior, that how, how many nodes have degree 1, 10, or 100, or 10,000, or 100,000, follows a very simple function like k to the minus 2, gamma over there is 2. And then you would say, OK, well, you just discovered a different function than what you expected. What's the big deal here? Right? And the big deal here is that that power law is fundamentally different from the Poisson that was our expectation, that was really used in all models before. And the reason why it's different is because in a power law distribution, you know, in a Poisson distribution, you have an exponentially decaying function, which means that it's very, very rare to find nodes that are much bigger than the average. However, in the power law, the fat tail of the distribution tells us that it's very common to have outliers, very, very connected nodes. And you can see that in distribution, we easily find nodes with, uh, uh, with thousands of links, and actually we have even 10,000 links in this particular case. So effectively, what the power law is telling us, that in real networks, you have highly connected nodes, or hubs. Nodes that have an exceptionally large number of links that collect a very, very large number of nodes together. And when you look at the map, you see those hubs. You see a few nodes that connect an exceptionally large number of other links. Those type of hubs would be simply forbidden in a random network. Now you may ask, OK, you just discovered that the World Wide Web is different from your expectation. Why do we care? Well, Things got really excited when we and others started to look at other networks, not just the World Wide Web. And then we started to see the same features over and over. You remember this map? This is the map of the internet. And when you look at it, you don't see all nodes having roughly the same degree. You see many, many small degree nodes, and you see a few major hubs that holding the whole thing together. And indeed, kind of a few months after our paper came out, a very famous paper now by Faluzos, Faluzos, and Faluzos came out. Three brothers, yes, computer scientists, different universities. And they showed that the internet infrastructure at the router level also has this power law distribution. And just to get the language right, we ended up naming these networks as the power law degree distribution scale-free networks because in a random network, the average degree acts like a scale. Everybody is similar to the average one, right? In a scale-free network, you have all the different scales coexisting together. You can't pick one node and say, that's what's going to be typical in this network. So what Faluzos and Faluzos and Faluzos have shown is that the internet itself is scale-free. But then, of course, an abundance of data came out. This is a data set that I will speak a little bit later about, which is the, the organizational map of a small company, or mid-sized company in Hungary, where the nodes are individuals, colors correspond to different regions of the company where they work on, and the node size corresponds to the degree, so you can see the high degree nodes. And you can kind of see that you don't have everybody to be equal, right? There are a few major hubs that seem to be talking to just about everyone, and they're holding the, uh, the uh, organizations together. And when people are able to map out large organizations, like IBM has done a massive mapping process of its whole organization, with at that time 400,000 employees, you find a, with really a gorgeous scale-free network emerging. But let's go beyond organizations. This is, I picked this example because this is a Scandinavian Swedish early social networking site before Facebook or in parallel with that was emerging, pusacom.com, it's a dating site. And, and, uh, and you know, whether you look at the number of contacts or people in your guest book or flirts, they had, you had different ways of kind of connecting to each other, you had always the same power law emerging telling us that most people have very few contacts, and a few have an exceptional number of, one, that number of them. And of course, if you would look at the Twitter structure, which the data is available, you would find exactly the same thing. And we know and we feel that, right, there are a few people like Obama to, uh, to others who have hundreds of millions of followers, right? And of course, most of us have very few. So, so this emerges clearly in social media as well. <laughs> 
And let me tell you now another Scandinavian example that is turned out to be very, very interesting and fundamental, and it's also in fun, fun its way, which is the Swedish sex web, right? Which is like in Sweden, when AIDS started to become kind of an important issue in the 1990s, Sweden has done a major survey of understanding the sexual habits of the country, which means that effectively they interviewed about 4,700 Swedes of a very uh, wide age group and, uh, and asked them lots of questions. There's a big, beautiful book called Sex in Sweden. It's a good coffee, coffee house reading, right? <laughs> that, that kind of summarizes those results. And, and what, that was published long, uh, for a while, but then Eric Eulerius, uh, who is a, who's a sociologist who kind of was following the network science developments, uh, he kind of realized that when you plot the, num the distribution of how many sexual partners everybody had, whether it's the yearly number that they were asked, they were asked how many day partners they had during the last year and how many did they have throughout the lifetime, when you plot it, you don't find a Gaussian distribution or a Poisson as indicative of a pure random process, but you find a power law distribution. Telling us that the vast majority of the people had one to 10 sexual partners during their lifetime, and then of course a few that have tens of thousands. And you may kind of think what is, what, that by itself is not surprising because there are professionals out there, right? What is interesting is that it's a continuous distribution. It's not there is one group there and everybody else is nice behaving, right? But there is a continuous distribution there and it's a fat tail distribution. And of course, if you think about it, what this means, it means that there are sexual hubs and you know why is that important for AIDS, right? Or any sexually or any sexually transmitted diseases. And then we'll get to that a little bit into that when we talk about epidemics. So this result was very interesting. It came out in nature. It was ridiculed by the epidemiologic community, partly because, oh, sweets are like that, <laughs> right? And partly that the sample is not right and everything, but then it initiated a huge amount of research in many different countries from Africa to the less, liber less liberal Sweden, uh, uh, UK uh, and US and the data was actually the same all over the world, right? So this, this is not something specific to Sweden. It is actually emerging in all different uh, uh, national data sets. And we'll come back to the consequences of that uh, in a second. And then I'm gonna give you one final example, I believe, which is all the networks I spoke so far about is somehow human-made networks, right? Communication system, uh, sexual networks, social networks. It sounds like there's something that we do to create hubs, but it's not the case. So what you have here is a little segment of the chemical network, a metabolic network within your cells. If you had lunch, that's the network that is processing and turning the whatever. If you had the fish, right, that will have to be turned into ATP because your cells don't understand fish. They only understand ATP and ADP. And there's also another network within your cell, the one that I showed you earlier, the big blue network, which is the protein interaction network. Many years ago was first available for yeast, today it's available for humans. Both of these networks, once the data became available, turned out to be scale free. Meaning that the vast majority of chemicals are very specific to, the, uh, to some few processes. They only interact with a few others or they participate in one or two or maybe three or four reactions but there are hubs. In the cell, uh, in the metabolic network, your hubs are ATP, ADP, water, carbon dioxide, and a couple of other essential molecules that participate in many, many reactions. In the protein interaction network, there are a couple of well-known uh, hubs that are mostly what we call transcription factors. And what I wanna kind of emphasize with this is that think about it, how mind-boggling this is. Networks that have absolutely nothing to do with each other within the cell that has developed over four billion years, right? And the internet we built in the last 50, 60 years and the World Wide Web that has a history of maybe 30 years and the Twitter that's by maybe 20 or 15 years old or whatever, they all converge to the same underlying architecture. And that was really the initial mystery of network science is that how is it possible that these networks whose nodes are really so different at scale and purpose, and so are the links, develop similar architectures. 
And that was a challenge that I was trying to address early on when we realized this, what we call universality. Physicists call universality the fact that these different processes have similar uh, 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 patterns of kind of uh, structural patterns. And so where does it come from? That's the first question. And the second question is, why can the random network model predict the existence of the hubs? What's missing from that model that it doesn't allow for hubs? And that came, then came a very interesting insight so that there are two fundamental differences between the Erdős and Rényi or the random network model and the real networks. And the first is that the random network model assumes that you have a bunch of nodes that you know already and you just have to connect them, right? Which the inner, the, the assumption behind that is that your set of nodes is static and your goal is simply find a clever way of wiring them together. In reality, however, those networks that exist out there didn't come out by having a billion nodes to begin with, right? They really grew one node at a time. Think about the World Wide Web, right? Now has trillions of web pages uh, uh, out there, but in, it, in what was that? In uh, 1991, there was one web page, Tim Berners-Lee's uh, uh, famous web page back in the CERN in Geneva. So the question, how did we go from one to trillion? One node at a time, always adding new nodes to the system. So this is what I call growth, that the real networks are always the result of some kind of growth process. And the way you would model that is to say, well, I have a small network, and then new nodes come in and try to connect to the existing nodes, like that node, right? So that's the first difference between the random network model and uh, real networks, the fact that real networks always grow and expand and change. The second one, however, is that the random network model tells us a very precise uh, 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 recipe, how you're going to connect your new node, just randomly, right? Pick any node and connect to them. However, what we started seeing in real networks that that assumption is violated. There is a preference towards the more connected nodes. Think about the word vibe again. More than a trillion pages out there. How many do you know personally? A few hundred at most. And whom do you know? Right? You know Amazon. You know uh, uh, Google. You know Facebook. You know. So the, and what is common between them? They're hugely connected nodes. And it's easy to see from a search perspective that the more links a node has, the more likely that you will ever encounter it. And, and hence, you, know only to, you connect only to what you know. And this is what we said, that the new nodes, when they come into the system, they prefer to connect to the highly connected nodes because the highly connected nodes are easier to find, right? And this is what we call preferential attachment. And the way we mathematically formulated this is to say, the probability pi that you will connect to a node with degree ki is just proportional to ki. The more links the node has, the more likely they will connect, which means that, for example, when this new node comes in, it could connect to a node with degree 2 or a new degree 4, but it's just twice as likely to connect to the degree 4 than the degree 2, but it's allowed. It could occasionally connect to the degree 2 in the same way that you can connect to your best friend's web page, and you will be the only one connecting to that, right? but that's perfectly allowed according to this probability. If you put these two pieces together, growth and preferential attachment, interestingly, you will start seeing the hubs emerging in the system. Because as the new nodes come in, they tend to f seek out the bigger, more connected nodes, and the, the, the more connected nodes grow faster than the rest of them, right? And the reach gets richer phenomena turns on, and naturally hubs will emerge in the system. And if you just consider these two phenomena, only these two, you do nothing else, you would find that the network that emerges has a beautiful power law distribution as far as you go, depending on how big network you can grow. So what, for me, what's kind of after so many years is still amazing in this story is that these two simple principles are able to kind of address the architecture to so many different systems. And don't get me wrong, in real systems, there's so many other stuff happening, right? Links could be rewired, links could disappear, nodes could disappear. Uh, and yet, what we learned over the last 20 years is that as long as the network is growing, and as long as there is preferential attachment, the network will develop hubs and will actually be scale-free. And that's what, and so little is required for the hubs to emerge, right? And that's the reason why so different networks end up kind of converging to the same 
underlying architecture because these two conditions are satisfied in all of them. Now, now that we have a mechanism, you would say, why do we care? Do hops really matter? How do they change the way we think about and these, uh, is these networks behave? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a few stories that tell us how important it is actually to have these hops in the system and how they alter the behavior of the system. And first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about network robustness. Why do we care about network robustness? Because many complex systems that are network-like or virtually all suffer from the problem that nodes and links could break. And the question is how the breakdown of individual nodes and links affects the structure of the system and its integrity and its ability to function. And, and so the one way to test that is to start with the simple network that I uh, uh, um, I built earlier. Let's see now. I think it's going to happen. Not yet. Um, there we go. Okay. And we start with this little network and we start randomly removing nodes. And what you see is you kind of follow that process is that as I'm removing nodes, obviously, when I remove a node, the links disappear. So the wall network is shrinking. But in an odd way, the network doesn't simply want to break apart. And this is not just a video-based observations. One of the things that we noticed actually back in kind of 2000 is that these type of uh, scale-free networks have an amazing property that they are very, very robust to random failures. And which means that you can remove 95% of the nodes and the remaining 5% are still together. Why is that? Because of the hops. Because we have a hierarchy of s bigger and smaller hops in the system and many, many small nodes. But because we have many, many small nodes in the systems, when you randomly break nodes down, you're most likely going to break a small node down, right? Because there's so many of them. And when you do that, the network will shrink. The biggest nodes will also get a little smaller because they lost some links, but they will not affect the integrity of the system. And even if you accidentally hit one of the bigger hops, there are other hops to kind of maintain the connectivity of the system. So, and this is not just a claim, we actually showed that indeed the critical point at which these networks break down because of the hops converges to one. And I'll tell you that in the next slide of what's the mathematics behind that. But then there's a price we pay for that, and maybe I clicked too early. What if you don't remove the nodes, but you go on attack? You remove the biggest node, and then the next biggest node, and then the next biggest node. So let's be really malicious. And in no time, you are actually seeing the network breaking apart. So we started from the same network. And <coughs> let me see if I could stop this. And, and, and even like a little bit earlier, right? <coughs> and let's look at the setup we ended up, right? I, on, the, on the left, I removed 30 nodes, and the network is still together. On the right-hand side, I removed only 11 nodes, and the network is broken into tiny pieces. And this is indeed a real feature of large scale free networks and many real networks that they're very, very robust to failures, but they're very fragile to attacks. Because once you know how the network looks like and you start removing the hops, the system is so dependent on the hops that the network will break into tiny pieces. This is what we call the Achilles heel of scale free networks. If you know the structure, you know who the hops are, you can destroy them very easily. But of course, this is good news and bad news in many ways, but most of the time good news, which is partly explains that why is it that when somebody you know, like goes on a vacation, the organization doesn't break apart immediately, doesn't stop working. It explains why is it that as I'm giving a talk, there are probably millions of errors in my cell. The molecule is not arriving to the right place to do the reaction, and yet I'm able to continue talking. Right? So in a way, it tells us really that there is this inherent robustness built into the structure of the network, and, of course, there is some price for it, right? Which is the attack intolerance or the, 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 fa uh, the failure intolerance. And that could also be good news in some cases because we could use that feature to really kill organisms that we don't want around, like bacteria and so on. Now, that's one aspect of why the network matters. Let me give you another example that seems to be very different, but it's very closely related, which is epidemics, right? We all came out from a, from a, uh, a major epidemic, the COVID one. 
But it turns out that 20 years before the COVID epidemic, network scientists, particularly Alessandro Vespignani, my colleague actually in Boston, and Romado Pasto Satoras, have really started thinking deeply about what how the structure affects the network. And what's interesting is that they realized that virtually all the models that existed for epidemic spreading were based on a random network model. And, you know, and that's because they, no one had any better. And the way epidemics kind of looks at it is to say, well, I have what we call a spreading rate of the virus, which is lambda, which is the likelihood that if you are actually come close to someone who is infected, you will also get infected, right? And, and the question is, depending on what that spreading rate, what fraction of the population would be infected? And a key fundamental result of epidemic spreading, based on which all methods to eradicate epidemics is really rely on, is the, the finding that there is a critical lambda, meaning that if the what spreading rate is under a threshold, the disease will die out naturally, right? Because if it's very hard to spread, then, then it just people are going to get cured or die before they could pass it on. And this is the basis why we're told to use condom against AIDS, right? Because it not only protects you, but it will decrease the epidemic threshold so that eventually the disease would die out. But it didn't work, right? In a sense that, that the AIDS epidemic was a good example, that, uh, that it was, AIDS virus is very hard to pass on, right? And I don't gonna give you actually any ideas, but typical statistics shows that it takes about 300 sexual intercourses with somebody with the virus to pass it on. So it's very hard to pass it on, right? Yet, it spread like crazy. So based on the epidemic models, it should, was A, under the spreading rate of critical threshold, and, it did, and yet it spread. Why? Because the network is not random, right? Because we're not, have, we, not everybody has the same number of sexual partners, right, as I showed you earlier, but rather it's a scale-free network. And one of the features of scale-free networks is that the second moment of the distribution, the width is very, very large. It goes to infinity in a large system. And you could analytically show that the critical point at which the, net, the, the disease disappears is really the average degree divided by the second moment. However, in this, this, is, this quantity is finite in a random network. In a scale-free network, k-square goes to infinity, which means critical point goes to zero, which is we are, let's see, uh, uh, Let's see, so the curve is like that. So the epidemic threshold actually disappears. So even a very weakly uh, kind of infectious epidemic can and will spread because it will eventually get into the hops and the hops will infect lots of other nodes and the hops will actually be in a permanent state of infection. They would always kind of be as a reservoir for the disease. And this was a game changer in the way we think about diseases and this was the first time when we saw how important these hubs and the network structure is really to understand them. And of course, it was on this background that Alessandro Vespignani ended up developing a whole network-based method about 15 years ago to predict epidemics. And so when, and the first it was tested actually in the, uh, in the H1N1 epidemic in uh, 2009, where he predicted that the virus that starts from Mexico will actually pick up, and this is actually his simulation, and said, how many people and how many cities will be infected? So this was a simulation done in 2009, and he predicted for the H1N1 that the virus will peak in November, which was a very unexpected prediction because most influenza-like viruses peak out on the Western Hemisphere in January or December. And everybody ridiculed him back in June when he published that, and he was absolutely right, and that had major policy consequences because there was actually a vaccine against that, against the H1N1, well, not a vaccine, but uh, well, actually it was a vaccine for that, but that was only arriving to the population in December. And he was predicting it's gonna be too late, and he was too late, right? And why was this different? It's because the virus didn't start out from Southeast Asia, as most influenza viruses do, but came from Mexico, and therefore had a different route on the network. What really matters here is that in 2009, starting from 2009, we have a very accurate network-based prediction of how viruses will spread. And that was the reason why in 2019, December, in our institute where Alexander works now, 
we were already freaked out about H1N1, right? And we were shopping like a, a month before, uh, like a month before the close down happened. And I remember that I was supposed to be giving this talk, this very talk, in March 2020. And I remember sending an email to the organizers, right, to say, "Hey, are you sure you're going to do it?" And I was told, "Yes, everything is okay in Denmark." <laughs> <laughs> that was a month before that, right? And we said, no, our data doesn't show. And we have a track of emails. And then even a week before the talk, I said, it's not going to happen. And I was told, it is going to happen. And then three days before the talk, it was canceled. <laughs> right? So that's why we're here today. So <laughs> and, and sure enough, you know, Alex Vespignani became the White House modeler, and this is already an H1N1 model, actually, of how this is spreading. And the, one of the reasons we were able to manage the kind of, uh, and to make rational decisions, is because the tool set was ready and available, and he kind of, uh, everybody could run it for their own country. And I'm sure many of you were involved, actually, doing it here. And of course, this was a very interesting moment, like a tragic moment for society. But a great moment in for, for network science because everyone became a network scientist, right? At the dining table, people were talking about reproduction rate and the role of the hops and contract tracing. Things you were using language that previously, six months before, you could only hear at the network science conference, right? So <clears throat> let me okay, are we 55 minutes into it or how are we doing time-wise? No, we're good, right? Yes, perfect, yeah. So let me switch gears now, and what I wanted to show here is that the network structure does matter, right? And if you do have the wrong structure, you do make wrong predictions, as epidemiology has been doing pretty much since 2001 when Alessandro Vespignani came along and said, listen, these networks on which epidemics are spreading are not random networks, and then you revise the whole theory, and thanks to that we have now much more accurate models. But what I want to do next is to go even more precise, and not just simply talk about the role of the house, but could we really use to make falsifiable predictions about uh, uh, real systems? And I had the pleasure to kind of uh, be part of a line of research where I couldn't believe it even today how far we got with that, which is the question of network control. What is control? Control is your ability to kind of fully control the behavior of the system, a typical car, had about five to 6,000 components. The electric car is much lower, it's 1,000, 1,500, right? But what's interesting about the car is that when you drive a car, you're not thinking about 6,000 components. You're only controlling the behavior of the steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brake. And through that, you're controlling the rest of the car. All the pieces, all the 6,000 pieces are controlled by these three components. And so much so that I would urge you not to buy a car that doesn't have that property, right? So the question is, how is that possible? And the reason why it's possible is because the car has been engineered to really be controllable from these three points, right? Because at the end, behind the network, behind the car, you have a very, very complicated network. What I would like to do today is to pose a challenge. What if you inverse the problem? Here is the wiring diagram of a vehicle happens to be a motorcycle, the car would be too big to show, right? Could you find out the three components from which you can, you can control the rest of this network? And of course, if you are an engineer, I'm sure many are here, you could point to the right place, right? But this is the type of challenge we often have in science. We're given a massive network of subcellular uh, uh, interactions or, or uh, a network of or or organization, and we would like to find out how is this system controlling itself? And does it control itself? So this is a journey that we've been doing for many years, is to try to understand how, how do you control a network? And we had lots of help from engineering, because there is, a, there is a whole field of engineering called control theory that has a formal theory of control. And what is important about control, that we're not talking anymore about the structure as, as well. We're talking about the behavior of the system. So on each node now, you need to have some kind of time-dependent variable that I'm going to go describe as an X, right? Is the traffic on the node, on the, on the street, uh, the, the number of molecules created per second in that chemical reaction, whatever that is, right? Or the firing rate of the neuron in that moment. 
And then these pieces are connected through a network, and the activity of each node is not only determined by its own desires, but also by the activity of the nodes that are feeding it with traffic or so on. So there's a formal description, it's called the linear uh, uh, model, that tells us that you know, how my behavior as a node changes in function of whom I'm connected to. And formally, the way you would describe it is that you say, I have a tiny network, each node has this variable on it, and I'm connected, so I have a network structure, which is this matrix A. And then control comes in by saying, I'm able to go ahead and inject signals on certain points by controlling those points, like pushing the gas pedal from that, right? And, and that signal only comes on that selected point. And the question is, could I control from, say, these two nodes, the rest of the nodes? And the answer was actually given by Rudolf Kalman in 1963, who set up what we call the Kalman criteria, which allows us to really calculate whether you can control a node from not from that particular point. And just to give you an idea, this is a not a trivial problem. Control is not just simply getting a signal somewhere, it's to get unique signal. So if you look at the control theory textbook, you would find this system is controllable. I'm sending signal on the top, and there are time delays between the nodes. And I can make the last node, x3 and x2, to go anything that I wanted by setting the right signal at the top. So I can control the full system based on the karma criteria. But karma criteria would tell us that this system is not controllable. And the reason why it's not controllable is that, yes, I'm sending one node and one signal to the main node, but I have no control, independent control, between x2 and x3. They are correlated, right? They, they work in tandem. They go up and down together. And <clears throat> So how would you control a system like that? You need one more signal, right? You need to break that symmetry. And, and generally, Karman criteria tells us how, whether a system is controllable or not. In 2011, we had a paper where we managed to show that you can actually identify who are the control nodes in a system in a very efficient way by mapping it into another network problem, so-called matching problem that graph theory study. I don't want to go into the solution to that, even though that was the beauty of the problem, right? Of how you identify the control nodes. But what it did for us, really, is that if you start from this network and say whether this network is, who are the control nodes in the system, here I'm showing you as a vibrating nodes, those, those nodes that are not, con the, from which you cannot control the rest of the network. Just to give you an idea that most nodes are not control nodes. And next I'm going to turn on uh, the, the control nodes and the red nodes are those are now kind of slowly pulsating are those that are the control nodes. Why am I showing you this? Because now we have a very efficient algorithm thanks to merging network science with control theory to, to really tell you what are the nodes from which you can control a system. Now the question is, how do you know that you are right? You have a beautiful mathematical theorem that works maybe for electrical circuits, but is this a general theory? And and this is where we actually got lucky because we were able to show experimentally that this works. And we did so by focusing on the C elegance. C elegance is a little warm that is on the Earth. If you take a pile of Earth, there will be thousands of it in there. And it doesn't, it, it's not a very smart animal. It has only 300 neurons and only 1,000 uh, cells altogether. But it still does lots of things. For example, it doesn't like to be touched. So when you touch it like here, it will turn around and run away, right? So no, no caressing with, uh, with C. elegans, right? And, and, the, and biologists have worked a lot, in particular neuroscientists, to understand how does it do it, right? With the 1,000 cells and 300 neurons. And the model they came up with is shown over here, right? There are what we call sensory neurons along the body of the animal. These are the sensory inputs. There is a 300 neurons, well, there are these neurons that are kind of what we call the control system, and they send signal to the muscles, which are along the body, and the, then, you know, when the right signal comes, they say, oh, somebody touched me, I gotta change direction, go in opposite direction. So this, why do we know that? Because there is 30 years of experimentation that mapped out every single neuron that is involved in that pathway. What, so this is a close problem, many Nobel Prizes given for that. But here's what's interesting. When you actually look at the wiring diagram of that neural network, it doesn't look like that nice pathway. It looks like that, right? And here I'm highlighting those neurons in orange. 
that were on the previous image, right? So they don't just do that pathway. They're connected to dozens of other neurons. And, and, and so how do you go from this to this other one, right? And could we use network science and control theory to do that? And the answer was yes. And the principle that we ended up using is very simple. You remember I showed you that this one on the left is not controllable, but the one on the right is controllable, right? Because I have a symmetry breaking. It turns out you can generalize to say, uh, it's a little bit the kindergarten problem. It's a very ruly kindergarten where if you have fewer teachers than kids, you can control the class, right? <laughs> And you must have more teachers than kids in order to have full control. And, and it turns out this, this principle can be applied by applying the control equations to this massive network that I showed you earlier. And then we ask the question, if I remove a node, which is what experimentally the neuroscientists do, and that's how they discover the neuron is involved in something, will it affect the animal's ability to control its muscles? And we did that exercise, we realized that the vast majority of the neurons, if ablated, which means that you burn them out, doesn't affect the control of the muscles. Of the 279 neurons, only 12 neurons had the effect that they will affect mobility. It, you know, this was a pure prediction from applying network science and control uh, to the neural network there. And what's interesting about this prediction, it wasn't tell us, like, here are the most likely neurons who would do that. No, it said only these 12 and no one else, right? And when we looked into the literature, this prediction recovered 30 years of experimentation. We got exactly the same neurons as the 30 years of experiments have provided us, plus one that was not known experimentally, which was a very peripheral neuron. Nobody thought we should actually ever check it experimentally. So we ended up convincing, actually, a colleague of ours, uh, well, actually from Cambridge University in the UK, a neuroscientist, to do the experiment. And this is what we were predicting, actually, uh, in this case, that, that this neuron, which is in the middle, if you knock it out, will affect the muscle's ability to control themselves. And sure enough, it worked. And the reason I'm really excited about that is not because we got another Nature paper out of it, but this was a full, you know, falsifiable prediction, right? We made a very precise prediction, no ambiguity out, and then we stayed on the site for six months to do the experiments and hoping we'll be right, and we were right, right? And not only that, there were other layers of the prediction that was pretty much on the money that they were able to ex experimentally. So, this is just to show the evolution of how far you can take this type of thinking, that knowing the network structure, you can actually make now not just kind of ranking things who is the most problematic, but very accurate prediction if you combine it with tools of engineering, since we're an engineering school. And let me end with one piece of research that we are also doing still in the lab, and it's very active, which again shows the value of network science, which is network medicine. Network medicine is a rethinking of how the cell works from the network perspective. And the reason why this is important is because the Human Genome Project has provided us the list of genes, which is to say it provided us the nodes, but it never gave us the links, right, how they interact with each other. And this is equivalent with giving you the proverbial phone book that doesn't exist any longer, but you remember those times we had the phone book with the addresses and the phone number of everyone, right? And I say, here is Copenhagen's phone book. Can you tell me how the city works? And can you tell me to hide to find one somebody? And you would say, I have no idea unless you also give me a map, right, of how the roads and where the notes and things like that. And genomics didn't give us the map. It just gave us the list of the names and, and, and the addresses. And network medicine is out there to try to address that. And we have at Harvard a division of network medicine that has more than 200 researchers working on using these ideas to further uh, human health. And there are major successes of that. One of them is that, how do you think about disease in the context of a network like that? And one of the key discoveries was that when you look at the disease genes, and here I'm highlighting in purple 
the genes that are involved in uh, <coughs> asthma, which is a, a, a you know, respiratory disease, they're not randomly distributed. They all tend to clump together, right? And the reason is because asthma is really a breakdown of a part of the network, and those who are part of that, they could actually break down in many different ways. And this is what we call a disease module. And we can use these type of tools to really identify the network neighborhood where asthma really resides in the cell. And then once you have that neighborhood, then you can start designing drugs because the drugs have to hit there in that neighborhood. You can try to think about drug repurposing opportunity, treatments, and so on because it's a flashlight effect. Right now you can ignore the rest of the network and just focus on that neighborhood, and that's very manageable. And this has led to some major successes. One of them, we actually, when COVID started, my lab, I was leading a collaboration between multiple labs at Harvard, MIT, Boston University, uh, where, where we ended up using these tools to predict what of the existing drugs, about 6,000 drugs, would be effective against COVID. And then our colleagues at Boston University ended up experimentally testing that and showing how good our predictions are. And this was very interesting because this was before the vaccine became available. And at that time, it wasn't at all obvious how long will the vaccine take. Remember the predictions that it may take sometimes two to five years to get or 10 years to get a vaccine, a successful one? So this was at that moment, at the early stages, the only path to go forward is to find existing drugs. You couldn't develop new drugs because it takes 10 years to approve a drug, right? So, so we ended up doing that. But the, but the one that actually now affects many patients, which is a network-based predictions, is a company that I funded several years ago that uses network tools to predict what drug will work for you as a patient. And this is a major problem because, for example, when it comes to RA, rheumatoid arthritis, typically the doctors say, okay, you have the disease and let me start giving you a set of drugs one by one and come back six months later, see if it worked, and then come back again six months later, if it didn't work, I'll give you another one. And using network tools, we can actually take out that guessing process for, and we can just purely tell you this drug will work for you and the other one doesn't. And this is a tool that is already available. Uh, every, every week, actually, thousands of patients are using that in the United States. So it's just been approved, actually, by Medicare. And there's the same type of tools now we're used in my lab, and I didn't have a chance to talk about it, is to say how the food molecules that you eat actually are perturbing the network. And using that, we can actually predict what molecules in your food are healthy and they could even cure disease through that drug, and which are the mole molecules that can actually affect particular cellular processes towards creating disease. So this is a general tool that cannot be only used in medicine, but can be also used in nutrition and the way we think about how, <coughs> you know, what is the healthy food or not. So this is probably a good moment for me to stop. And uh, what I would like to uh, finish is this particular slide which is, you see two materials here. One, of, one is a soft and malleable material, which is, uh, uh, which is graphite, right? Your pencil pen uh, uh, is from that. And the other one next to it is diamond, which is the strongest material we have on Earth. And how amazing the fact that they're made exactly of the same atoms. And what's the difference between them? And it's obviously the network, right? The way the, net, the carbon atoms are wired together can give you to a very soft and malleable material which we prize because of softness so we can write with it or it can give you the hardest material. And what I hopefully convince you a little bit is that not only the fact that most complex systems we care about are really network-based systems and we must use a network framework to understand that, but the, really the structure matters, right? And you cannot really have a hope of understanding these complex systems unless you start first mapping out the network behind that. Because that structure, that network determines the system's robustness, and I showed you how. We talked about spreading, how important is the structure for how the things are spreading. I, we talked about controllability, allow us to make very precise predictions of who is involved in the brain on, in specific processes and it affects resi resilience and observability and many other things. So at the end, you know, in the era of complex systems, there is no more way of understanding complex systems unless you start with the basics. And the basics is the network, the connectivity between the, between the components that you care about. 
And once you got more or less that right, you can start asking higher level questions of network dynamics and so on. But the journey of understanding complexity really goes through networks. And I'll end here. I'm just going to put this slide on and say it takes always a village, right? But I messed it up. <laughs> so uh, this would be, of course, the, the all-important acknowledgement slide. And thank you very much for your attention. All right, so we're on the hour, but we're gonna take time for just a couple of uh, questions from you before ending. If you need to sneak out, please do so quietly. Um, I know there's one question that you all have on your mind, so I'm just gonna answer that ahead of time, right? Uh, Sex in Sweden, uh, published by Routledge. You can get it for eight bucks on Amazon, just uh, <laughs> covering that one. Uh, but then I think I'm going to hand it off to everyone in the, in the room. And uh, so raise your hand and uh, we'll take a couple of questions. Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. For interesting talk. I have a question about climate change. Mm -hmm. Did anyone work on climate change and try to do network uh, science in it? Yes, they, there, there is a little literature, they're not too big, and, and it's very special, right? So I know of a couple of major papers that looked at uh, networks they build from, from correlation, correlations in the, in the kind of weather patterns around the world, and, the, and they use that one to say that they can make actually more accurate prediction about weather events and outliers and so on. Obviously, if you want to study climate change, you want to go to the root of the problems and look, at, build a massive network like Sune and others are building here for Denmark for all the people, but to all the factors that affect climate change. I'm not aware of anybody is doing that or anybody would have the data, but obviously if we want to solve not climate change, we need to have a massive network model. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. I was wondering, uh, when you want to map a network and you have only partial information, you don't have the full information, mm -hmm. uh, is there some way of, uh, uh, some, uh, way of limit or some, uh, some methods uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, pred to predict that? Oh, that's a wonderful question because none of the networks that we have around us are ever complete, right? With a few exceptions. I think the C. elegance map, thanks to many, many people's map, has, has been accurate and complete as far as we know. So the question is, what do we do when we don't get the net, uh, uh, an when we get an incomplete network? There are a certain number. First, what we need is that there are quite a number of inference tools that are aiming to infer missing links from the network structure and network topology, and particularly in the, met, in the protein interaction network that have been studied over and over and benchmarked and, and so on. So there's a whole literature, and now that AI is coming along, there are many others. So if you look for network inference, you will actually find many papers. But there's another route that we have often taken when we cannot do that, right? Which is to say, does the network incompleteness matter for the problem at hand, right? And for control, it matters a lot, for example. But for many other processes, as long as you say the behavior that I care about is doesn't seem to be dependent on the network incompleteness, then you're good. And you can easily test that by simply taking the existing map, which is inherently incomplete, and removing further nodes and links. And if the behavior that you care about is really unchanged, then really you're talking about something that is robust to that uh, incompleteness. But of course, you don't want to remove too much because then you change the integrity of the network. So these are the two routes you can choose. And the third route, of course, is, is much more massive efforts to map out more accurately. Yeah. Yes. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Um, I was just wondering if you could maybe tell us a little bit more about the tool that you made for arthritis and how that connects to network science? Sure, absolutely. So uh, it's a very interesting one. Why do we need a network science tool? Because in the age of AI, couldn't AI tell you what drug will work for you or not? And it can accept that you have 20,000 cells and you have at most a few hundred patients to train on. And what is what we call overfitting in the case of the AI, right? That you will build a tool that would work perfectly but will never work for other people who are outside of your pool. It's a well-known problem. So what do you have to do? You have to restrict the number of 
proteins or the genes or, uh, that you are looking at. So what we do is that we use network science to restrict the number of genes that are involved in the disease. And in this case, I believe we restrict it to 16 proteins and, and their expression patterns. And then once you restrict it to 16, you can now trade for this 16 an AI that is accurately and transforms for another one. So at the end, what the network science tools is, is the flashlight, right? That's what it offers, is to say, you don't have to worry about the wall cell because there's so much going on. When it comes to arthritis, these are the 16 biomarkers that really matter, you would say, in the biological language, right? And then now that I have 16, then I can train a very straightforward AI method on the 16s, and it's hugely predictive. Sure. All right. I think we've reached the end of the questions. So then I would just like to ask everyone to thank uh, Laszlo one more time, and thank you all for coming. Just before uh, ending in uh, here, thank you very much, uh, Laszlo, on uh, behalf of DTU, the Ørsted board who planned, uh, planned the uh, event, on behalf of all of us here in the auditorium and those who are listening in on online and those that will view the lecture after we have published uh, it. Thank you. And as a small token of our appreciation, a little uh, memento to take uh, to take back home. Thank you, thank you. I hope it's Danish chocolate, right? <laughs> now the lecture is over, the program in the auditorium is finished, but there's an opportunity to stay a little longer outside. There's a small reception and you can uh, continue to debate and discuss uh, what you have heard uh, in here. Thank you very much. <laughs>